bow our heads now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for just another opportunity that we have to come to speak of the lovely Lord Jesus. And now, as it's raining outside, may the Spirit of the Lord rain upon us on the inside, down in our hearts, and make known to us His divine providence, our, the will of God to be willed in our life. We've set this day aside, Father, after the morning services and things. We are going to pray for thy sick children. I pray, God, that this will be a day that we'll long remember because of your blessings upon us. We pray for this a ministerial group, all the brothers, all the ministers around through this country here. God bless their ministry, and may they grow deeper experiences all the time in Christ. That's our desire, Lord, to know you better. I pray for each church and each denomination that will grow in the grace and power of God. We pray for all the sick and the afflicted now that they'll be healed. And if there be any chance there's some here with us today that doesn't know thee as their Savior, may this be the day that they'll say that one all together yes to you. Bless thy word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I certainly want to thank first this group of ministers here of this uh, Birmingham and uh, the parts of the country here where they come in on this sponsorship to help me to come here. And I, I tell you, I think that ministers like that is to be honored. Your congregation should honor your your pastor because, see, he's out, he's a shepherd, and if he finds something or he thinks it'd be good feeding, he'll lead his flock to it. And sometimes it's disagreeable. Sometimes it's, uh, some of them don't uh, see it that way, and maybe they don't like that for their sheep, don't like the kind of pastoring. But to be one of the feeders also, a shepherd, I just try to bring the real grass of God, the real food, the Word. And so I, I appreciate them so much, and I pray that God will ever bless them. And may their life uh, be an influence to whosoever they come in contact with. Each one of us has ministries. A certain ministry will catch the eye of a certain person where the other one wouldn't do it. See, So we put ourselves together, as I said at the beginning, to try to bring the best that we know how with our ministry, my ministry, theirs, and so forth. We put it together to try to help you people to know more about Jesus Christ and to be better fit servants for him as the, as the time approaches where we have to meet him. Now, I want to thank the, the people here that let us have this armory. This is a nice building, and we appreciate that very much. We thank them with all of our hearts, and I pray that each and every one of them will, if they're not saved, will be saved. And in that great hall of God yonder, when the angels sing, when the redeemed walks in, well, I trust that every one of them will be there without missing a one. And I, I thank you people. I never got a chance to ask the manager, but I believe that all the expenses and things were met, and I, I appreciate that. Every offering, everything that you did. And usually they take up a, an offering. Did they do that? You didn't have to do that. They said, he said they give an offering after everything was paid. You know, I've been a, in behind the pulpit now for 33 years, and I never took an offering in my life. Never one time, even in my own church, never took an offering in my life. I worked when I passed the church there, the Tabernacle of Jeffersonville, I, 17 years with the public service company, and never one time took an offering in my life. I paid my own... Uh, expenses and so forth and paid my tithes and everything I could right into the church and everything went right into the church. And now, usually out here, uh, they give me an offering. Now, I want to make it clear because some of the trustees are sitting present now. The offering that's given to me, the money, it doesn't go directly to me. I get a salary from the church. I get $100 a week. Uh, that's uh, $5,200 a year. $100 a week. But now, to the offering that you give to me, it's designated to the work of the Lord. Here's what the trustees does with it. It cannot be spent for nothing else. It's earmarked, as we call it. That it cannot be spent for nothing else. That money goes into a certain treasure. 
when that treasure builds up called, for overseas missions, designated to that, and now many times overseas, you can see what we get up against here in the United States, and you can imagine what it'd be over there. And when we go over there to those poor people that don't have nothing, not even enough to eat, way back in those heathen lands, I've seen little mothers laying on the street and their little babies, their cheeks sunk in and dying, and a mother trying to give you the baby, and if you take that one, here's another one, here's another one, another one, and nothing at all to eat. And we wake, rake out enough in our garbage cans to feed those people. That's right. We don't realize how well off we are. And in the African jungles and so forth, what them people got to bring me over there? They haven't got one cent. They don't no way at all of getting me there. And I feel that they should hear the gospel too. And the gospel that, that the Lord Jesus has given us this week, I take that money because you give it to me. And I'm the steward of it. So it goes in by me working in this foundation that it cannot be spent for nothing else but overseas missions. And it takes the same gospel right over there to them. Don't I go myself so that I know that I do the very best I can knowing that I have to answer for every cent of that money. And I, I want to be a good steward to God. If I can't be faithful over those things, then how am I going to be faithful over other things? See? So I want to want to thank you. And the offering that w was given to me, as the brother just said this afternoon, I, I asked them not to do that. But usually if they don't, and they know this, if the expenses cannot be made, then we take some of that offering of it's been sent in by mail at the church where it's designated to this other, then we write off the expenses. Don't, don't cost nobody. See, we never, and I have absolutely told the manager in every meeting, Brother Jack Moore sitting here was one of my first men in the field. He knows that I never would stand still for no begging for money. Who will give this? Who will give that? Pass the collection plate and forget about it. God, it, when he when he quits for, when he quits supplying my needs out here, it's time for me to leave the field. In so I don't believe in this begging and pulling and persuading and threatening and and everything else for money. No sir. When I first come into the ministry, I found out through history these three things that hurt the man, a servant of Christ. And when you, God will bless him and give him just a little ministry, then the first thing you know, one of the downfalls is money. Next is popularity. When he gets to think he's somebody, right then he's on his road out. See, uh, we're, there's no big shots among us. We're all the same. We're God's children. See, there's none of us big and none of us little. We're all God's children. Then money, popularity, and women. And I'm noted as a woman hater, so you know, <laughs> that's the way away. <laughs> so that. That's out of the picture. I got one woman is all the woman in the world, and that's my wife. Sweetest woman that God ever put on earth for me. <laughs> that's right. She's mine and mine alone, and I'm hers and hers alone. And that when I was a young man, I thought that. Now I'm an old man, and I still think it. So uh, she, I tried to shun those things and tell Lord Jesus, God, it's so hard getting out here because the ministry is so much different. It just, just puzzles people every way. I have hard enough to fight those things with Satan, let alone these others. So. I'm out to do the very best I can for everybody I can to the kingdom of God be glorified. Now, thank you kindly, and I hope someday I can come back and see you again. Amen. I hope I can. And I hope when I come again, thank you. And I hope when I come again, it won't be like this, where you got three days, nervous, upset, run in, present something that you don't even know what you're going into, you, you, you wonder. It's the wonder you have as much faith in it as you do. If we could sit down and begin back here in Genesis, day after day and night after night, and place that down there. See, it's got kind of, uh, you know, you kind of get feeling like you spooked around. You, you know what I mean? You, you don't know. Like the disciples one night, they were up on a stormy sea, and, and the little boat was waterlogged, and, and all hopes of survival was gone. And they were screaming and crying. Of course, as Christians, they were praying. And all at once, they seen him come walking on the water. And they thought it was a ghost. They thought it was a spirit. And they were scared and they began screaming out. And just think, the only thing that could help them, it looked spooky to them, they were afraid of it. That's again. When the only hope we have is him. And the very promise of the word. And yet we're afraid of it. And just, just afraid to give it a trust. It's, it's too bad. But remember, history always repeats itself. It has to remain that way. And... Uh, I've heard you uh, through the week and through other, uh, through many of these perhaps take the tapes and so forth, which my ministry in that way goes around and around the world everywhere. Many times you hear me say, uh, those denominations 
It kind of condemns denominations. It isn't I'm condemning the people. I'm condemning the system. See? Right. Not the denomination, the people in there. Oh, no. My people formerly were Catholic. I'm Irish, descent. They're Catholic. Now, I know there's some fine Catholic people. Some of them are my own people. They're fine. They're fine Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, every denomination, fine people. But then systems that keep us separated, that's the thing I'm against. We are one in heart. We must be that way. And then our system draws a doctrinal line, and that's if the first church ever started, the first church, any church, would say, we believe this and end their doctrine with a comma instead of a period. We, there's never been nothing but one church. I thought, see, we, we believe this plus as much as God will let us know otherwise. But when we say we believe this and this is it and that's all, then we die right there, you see, because God is eternal and he's growing on. So thank you very much. And I want you to know there isn't a minister or a person in the world that I know of any human being, no matter who it would be, but what my heart beats for, I want them for the kingdom of God. I'm working for one place up there, not for any certain denomination. I was a missionary Baptist, ordained a missionary Baptist by Dr. Roy E. Davis from uh, Fort Worth, Texas. And I was stayed in the church, fine, fine bunch of brothers, and I still stayed in some of the finest men in the world in the missionary Baptist church. But when this gift was ministered to me, they couldn't go to that. The pastor even said, I lost my mind. Me, with a grammar school education, would preach the kings, potentates, monarchs, and healings and things. He said it can't be, but it was, because he did it. He said, Billy, you'll become a holy roller. I don't know what I am, but I know who I believe. <laughs> and someone said not long ago, said, a very fine man, riding with Brother Jack Moore and I, William Booth Cliburns, I think one of the shrewdest preachers I ever heard, can preach the gospel fully in seven dialects. And I said something to him about something he had mentioned, something I'd said. I said, well, that's just what the scripture says, Brother Booth. He turned around, if anybody ever knows him, he's a real uh, diplomat and Englishman, and he said, you just don't know your Bible. I said, but I know the author real well. <laughs> so to know him is life. And so, and so he, um, that's right, know him, to know him is life. And I know something happened to me. I'm not what I used to be. Like the old colored lady, if this would be excused, please, because this is not a place for joking. It is a joke. It actually happened. An old colored lady, she says, that. I'd like to give a testimony. Stand up, sister, and testify. She says, you know, said I hate what I want to be. And she said, I hate what I ought to be. But said, then I hate what I used to be. <laughs> she got started anyhow. So that's what I feel here. Uh, not what I want to be and not what I ought to be. But I know I ain't. I'm not what I used to be. <laughs> Something happened to me. About 25 years ago. And he's been in my heart ever since, and I love him with all that's in me. And I love you. How can I love him without loving you? I got a boy here in the meeting, and a little grandson. I'd rather really, if you got any compliments, pass it on them instead of me, because I'm a parent. So God feels the same way. If we can't love one another who we have seen, how do we go to love God then, see? We must love one another and honor one another. If I come here to deceive you into something that's a trap or something other, something God will never honor it. Look what he would do to me. What am I doing to his children? I can never get right with God on that. No, but I come because I love you. And God knows that's the truth. And I, I want to do everything I can. It's the joy that's laid up for you. I think the big table is spread. Each one of you has a right to it. Some people say divine healing isn't so. I know it is. See, I, you're too late to tell me that. See, I know, I know that's so. And the Holy Spirit in those things, I know it's true. And why would you stand off to one side with a with a, an old cold potato holding in your hand knowing it was a great big dinner set for every one of the saints of God. See, it's all far. See, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thanks to you a million. And now, and I hope to be back someday if Jesus tarries. Now, I guess you wonder why someone said the other day, I stood by a very famous man. I love the man. There's no need me call, not to call his name. He's my, one of my bosom friends, Oral Roberts. Oral come to my meeting, Brother Jack Moore's along. He had a little ragged tent setting up across the field over there on the, on the east side of Kansas City. And I was over in an auditorium, something a little bigger than this. He come over and stood on the sideline and said, Brother Branham, you think God would hear my prayer? I said, he'd hear anybody's prayer. Now, 
a man don't know what he's worth building a fifty million dollar seminary with a three million dollar office i think that's a credit and a contribution to the faith of one single little oklahoma boy for god tommy osborne he was up there that night when that maniac ran to the platform in portland oregon to kill me and he said you deceiver said you just call me everything great big man about 50 preachers on the platform fled from is insane out of the institution huge big arms stood six nearly seven foot tall great big arms i weighed 128 pounds you're out on the platform said tonight i'm going to knock you plumb out in the middle of that place i know better than to say anything to him and everybody scattered back and I just stood still. Don't, don't try to inject your own thoughts. If you do, you're going to be lost. I just stood still and I heard myself say this. That's the Holy Spirit saying through my lips. Remember, God only works through man. He chose man. He, he could have had the gospel preached through the stars or through the trees or through the wind, but he chose man. That's what he's ever done. Chose man. Revealing his secrets and his foreknowledge and stuff to his servants, the prophets, he said. Now, the fellow was standing just a few feet from me, and he had threatened what he was going to do. He looked like a Goliath. And there the Holy Spirit said, because that you have challenged the Word of God, tonight you'll fall over my feet. And now you can imagine a man in that kind of a rage would think about a man weighing about 128 pounds to nearly 300 pounds of, of like a mountain standing before you, what he thought. He said, I'll show you whose feet I'll fall over. And he jerked back his big fist. I never moved, just stood there. And he walked up to me, drawed back like this to hit me. And I heard myself, nothing that I had to say at all, said, Satan, come out of the man. No louder than that. And when he drawed his fist back, his hands went up, his eyes pushed away out and went around and around. His tongue went out and slobbers fell from his mouth. He turned around and around and around and fell down and pinned my feet to the floor. And then here come the policemen out and they was hunting for him I'd led those two police to Christ back there in the dressing room in this big auditorium and so I think we had 60 some odd hundred on the inside and pretty near twice that on the outside it pouring down the rain I'm standing up and down the streets of the umbrellas and he helped me on the floor and he said is he dead I said no sir well I said is he healed I said no sir he worships that spirit you see in no way helping him at all until he gets that out he said I said but I wish you'd roll him off of my feet so he, I could move See, Tommy Osborne saw that. And he went home and nailed himself in a room for three days. He drove all the way to Jeffersonville. And he come down there, a little nervous fellow running around his car. He said, you think I got a gift of healing? I said, Tommy, you look like a prosperous boy and something that would be a credit to the kingdom of God. I said, Tommy, don't do that. Don't go to thinking about those things. I said, you know God calls you to preach the gospel. If he calls you to preach the gospel, divine healing's included in it. And he went up with Brother Bosworth. And the other day I stood and looked at his building and oh my, a million and a half dollars or something in it. And I looked over there at Oral stand there. I was waiting. I'd been up Oral so nice and all of them showing me around real nice brothers. And I stood there and I thought, think, I was on the field before they started. They each one tell you that they caught the inspiration from that. And I thought, I'd hate for them to come to my office. I got one little typewriter sitting in the end of a trailer. I hate for them seeing. I thought, Lord, looky here. Look at this big building worth three million dollars, they say. And I thought, look down the road, and I went and said, the future home of so and so, future home. And I thought, but I, I don't say this in disregarding these brothers, but just what was said to me. I thought, where's my future home? Something said, look up. So that's good enough for me. So I look for mine up there. So I don't say if they won't be there too, you see, but that was just encouraging me, you see. I wouldn't have sense enough to know how to handle money like that. God knows that too. And then what if I had great big obligations like that? Do you think I could come here to this place? Do you think I could hold a three days meeting here like Brother Roberts? When Brother Roberts has to have around 10,000 every day. Well, I'd go wild the first day to meet that. See, I can hold a meeting where there's five people or two people or one person or go wherever he sends me. I have no need of anything but more of him. So that's what I want you to pray, that I'll have more of him to know him. Lord bless you. Every crowd now, they have three classes of people. Believers, make-believers, unbelievers. 
You have it in every crowd. Jesus had it in his. And I showed you the other night how he segregated them by saying things and never explaining it. See, he never said why they'd have to eat his body. Why he come, how he was it come down. Same one going up. When these people know he was just a man, had a bad name to begin with, but he said it just to test their faith. Those disciples never moved. They couldn't explain it. But look what Peter said, Lord, where would we go to? See, they had seen the word of God for that day that was promised for them, vindicated. They say, we know that that is the source. Look at the Shunammite woman the same way. When she got the little boy from the blessing of Elijah, she said, saddle me a mule and don't you stop till I bid you. See? And she went to the man of God and he didn't know, but she knew if God could have that prophet to tell her she would have a son, she could find out why God took her son. And she was persistent in doing so. And you remember, she stayed with her, her, her faith till she found out what, was, what caused it. And Elijah went, not even knowing what he would do, walked up and down the floor, laid his body upon the baby, and it come to life. You see, it's because if people believe, they, they can't explain, no one can explain God. But when you see God doing something in his word that he promised he would do it. Look at those drunken Roman soldiers on that day just before the crucifixion took place. Setting him out there and smacking him on the face and in the cheeks and things like that. Said, now if you're a prophet, tell us who hit you. He knew who hit him, but he didn't have to clown. See, he just, he just did. He said, verily, verily, St. John 5, 19. Now listen, verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing in himself. But what he sees the father doing, that doeth the son likewise. Therefore, he never done one miracle until God showed him by a vision what to do according to his own words. The son can do nothing in himself. Not what he hears, but what he sees the father doing, that doeth the son. No prophet, no seer in the Bible ever done thing at random. God shows first. So no, no human flesh, not even the flesh of Jesus himself, can glorify. It's all in God. God does the showing, the seeing. We just act it out as he shows us and tells us. Each one of us does that. So may the Lord bless you now. And I'm going to ask you again this afternoon as we read the word. Now, you're such a nice people. I could just stand and talk to you and talk to you. But I want to say again. I am doing a discredit to the message that God has given me. But just running here, we would have had five services, but I think we couldn't get the auditorium, so we had to just make it four. Here are three nights and then a healing service. What? See, you don't even know the first approaches. So maybe someday, if God willing, uh, in the help of God and cooperation of you fine people, I would like to come back and get all my brothers, all of them together. We. It may sound a little funny, but... Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Let us just... That, until that time, if I don't get to do it, remember, when I see you again on the other side of the river, God will witness again that this is the truth. I'm telling you, it's his word. Wouldn't I be a hypocrite? What, what, a, what would I have in store? I've got a wife and some children at home crying on the telephone a while ago. Why don't you come on home? But these other children are sick and needy. These other man's wives and husbands need salvation I can't do that but I expect to cross the river see over there I'll sit down and rest a little while and until then I'm getting old and I can't I can't feel like I did when I first started years ago but I just go anyhow just go anyhow because this is the last opportunity I'll be able to do it in, in this life the other life it won't require this let us stand now in respect of his word while we turn to Mark the 16th chapter and I'm going to begin to read from the ninth verse. Listen closely, if you wish. This is the closing message. This today is the closing message for this part of the campaign here. And it's this that I'm reading is the closing words, the last things that Jesus said to his church before he went away. The last words. Right immediately after the resurrection... The 16th chapter of St. Mark, I'm going to begin with the ninth verse. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first unto Mary Magdalena, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him 
as they mourned and wept. And they, when they heard that he was alive, just think of that, when they heard he was alive. Oh my, I hope we can hear the same thing today, you know, that he is alive. Heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believe not. After that, he appeared unto the others in another farm, unto two of them, as they walked and went into the country. That was Theopius and his friend going to Emmaus. And they went and told it to the residue, neither believe they them. After, afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. wonder if he'd do the same thing to us now. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Now, my text this afternoon, I'm going to take out of here a court trial. Now, let us bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we ask you now to take your word, and as we uh, bring up this afternoon this trial of thy word, we pray that we'll sense the presence of the resurrected Jesus. May we not be so slothful and as you said to those, when you talked to them on the road to Emmaus, how that you spoke to them and you told them that they were, what was they worried about? What they so sad about? And they said that you must be a stranger and told them that Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet indeed. And when they addressed you as a prophet, then it was just no more than behooving that you should go to the Word, being a prophet, for the Word comes to the prophet. Then you turned to them and said, Fools and slow of heart, to believe, not to believe all that the prophets have said concerning Christ, how he must suffer all these things that you have said, and then enter into his glory, and beginning from the Old Testament, way back at the beginning, he expounded to them what the prophets had said about himself. But then still they didn't understand. But once inside the building, the doors closed, then you done something just the way you did it before you were crucified. And then their eyes were opened. You vanished quickly out of their sight. And they ran and told these that to set it the dinner or the supper and upbraided them uh, because of their unbelief when you appeared in the walls and told them, that they should have believed you in the hardness of their heart. And how these disciples uh, rejoiced because you were made known, because you did something the same way that you did it before your crucifixion. They knew that was you the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh God, please today do it again. Come into our midst. And you promise these things for the last days. And may our hearts not be so dull with the with modern theology and the things of the world that we have failed to see. Open our understanding eyes, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Now, I trust that the appearing of his vindicated resurrection this week what little that we have seen, you could at this time, in this stage, being your first time, be a little skeptic of it, because the only thing you see is just the minor part. 
But it's never one time been wrong in the tens of thousands times, thousands of times. It's never been wrong. How many here is a witness of that? Raise up your hand. It's been never, no matter what nation, war place, it's never said anything would happen, but what happened exactly that way. So nothing can be that accurate but God alone. Right. I mean, certainly. But of course, it's got to look shady. It has to be that way. So did it in his day and so forth. Even his birth and everything else looks shady. God does that just to test the faith of his people. Now this afternoon, I thought it would be no more than right. And after his appearing before us and go through the building and discern the thoughts of the heart. And I've only used three or four little scriptures with you, which God knows that all scriptures join together. There's not one error in any of it. Not one contradicts the other one. Uh, people say it does. I've offered a year's salary to anybody who'll show it to me, or the word contradicts itself. It does not contradict itself. If it does, it's no good to me. It must be exactly the truth. Now, God is going to judge the world by something. If he judges it by the church, then what church? Because one different from the other. But he's going to judge it by Jesus Christ. The Bible said so. And Christ is the word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He judged in the days of Noah, and he judged in the days of Moses. He judged it every day in his day, and even to this day, by the same promised Word for that age. We either believe it or don't believe it. But he's responsible to make his Word right. You know, in Matthew 12, there it said that uh, though he had did so many things, yet the people could not believe because Isaiah says they got hearts, they can't understand, eyes they can't see, ears they can't hear it had to be fulfilled, and so does this have to be fulfilled. To be heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, false accusers, incontinent, and despisers of those that are good, having a form of godliness, and denying the power thereof, the power of the God that they have the form of. What a saddening thing. What if that was you? Think of a man or a woman who can't believe that. What if that was you? Just think of it. It's to be pitied, not to be scorned, but to be pitied. It certainly is the truth. Notice now, today I'm going to call what we would call for a few minutes now before we pray for the sick, and we're going to try to be out of here within the next 40 minutes if possible. But I want to have just a little trial first. And now the case is today in this court trial, uh, if you'll just listen closely and keep in mind what I'm trying to say, it won't be long. The case is the Word of God's promise versus the world. Now, a case cannot be called unless it's for some cause. You have to present the case. In the case that's called in this courtroom this afternoon, I want you, everyone, I, I charge you to listen to the case. Now, the case is the Word of God's promises versus the world. The case and the cause for the indictment is a breach of promise. Can you hear me all right? Raise up your hands if you're around everywhere now. You can hear. The, the indictment is a breach of promise. God made a promise and didn't stick to it. God's word made a promise. So uh, he's, being, he's being brought in for a, a court case. Breach of promise. Now, the prosecuting attorney always represents the state. If I understand the courts right. So the prosecuting attorney in this is representing the world. And the prosecuting attorney is Satan. He represents the world because the world belongs to him. And he's representing the world. And he is their prosecuting attorney. The defendant in this case is Almighty God. The defendant. And now the defendant always has a defense witness. And the defense witness in this case is the Holy Ghost. And now we're going to, and, uh, the prosecuting attorney also has some witnesses in the case, and I'm going to name them. And one of them is Mr. Unbeliever. The next one is Mr. Skeptic. And the next one is Mr. Impatient. These are the one that is trying to get judgment against God. Now, we have the, all the, the, Characters called in now, and we're in court, so we're going to call the court to order. All right, the order, order is the court is called to order, uh, to order, and the prosecuting attorney now is going to call his first witness to give witness. 
And his first witness to the stand is Mr. Unbeliever. And his complaint is that God's word of promise is not altogether true. That's what his complaint is, the first witness is. He claims that he is a believer, though he isn't, but he claims he is. And he claims that he was standing here some time ago, a Holy Ghost so-called meeting, where the people were laying hands upon the people and giving their scriptural uh, uh, rights to do this, reading it out of Mark 16, where I've just read. They shall lay hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. Mr. Unbeliever testifies, and he says that I had the hands of this, what was called the Holy Ghost filled preacher, lays hands upon me, according to Mark 16, the promise that God made, and the man said he was a believer, and many claimed to be healed, and he laid his hands upon me, and that's been two months ago, and nothing has happened. Therefore... The promise is not true. All right? We ask Mr. Unbeliever to step down. The prosecuting attorney, Satan, calls his next witness. Next witness stands up is Mr. Skeptic. Now, he testifies. He said, I went to a church, I was sick. And I went to a church that was supposed to have a godly pastor in it. That had faith in God's word. And he had a a little cruise of oil sitting up on his... uh, uh, on his desk, and all of his people that come in there want to be prayed for, he anointed them with oil, reading the promise out of God's Word in James 5, 14. Read the Word and said, If there be any sick among you, let them call the elders of the church, let them anoint them in oil and pray over them, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and God shall raise him up. If they did any sin, it shall be forgiven him. And now, he said, I had this pastor who had heard testimonies from others, anoint me with all, reading the scripture to me out of God's promise, and that has been over a month ago, and I'm still just as sick as I was when he anointed me. Therefore, that's his complaint. That Mr. Skeptic stepped down, and the prosecuting attorney, Satan, calls his, his next witness. His next witness is Mr. Impatient. That's a rascal. Excuse that expression. See? He just makes you, gets you so nervous you don't know what you're doing. See? Mr. Impatient. He claims that he one day while reading the Bible, all these claim to be believers now. And they, he claims that he was reading the Bible and he come across the passage of Mark eleven twenty two and 23. Where Jesus himself made the promise that if you say to this mountain, be moved. And don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you've said will come to pass. You can have what you have said. And again, he says, if you, when you pray, believe that you receive what you ask for. Now, he says, I have been a a crippled in my feet, lame in my feet for some 30 years. And I accepted that promise. Five years ago, and nothing has happened since. I'm still just as crippled as I ever was. Now, now the pros- then he steps down. Now the prosecuting attorney has to kind of show the case off. So the prosecuting attorney, which is Satan, says to the public, see, these people claim to be believers, and God is not justified in placing such rational promises in his word when he doesn't back it up. See, he's indicting God. He put these promises in his word for his believing children. And his believing children steps up here and testifies that they have accepted this claim that he has made in his word to be the truth. And they have no results from it at all. Therefore, he's indicting God, trying to get a case against him, to say that God has put something in his word for his believing children and does not stand behind what he promised. 
also, he claims that、um, it, he is unfair to make such a promise to people, to his believing children, and is not able to back up what he said he would do. Now the prosecuting attorney is showing a hard case here against the defendant. He's not able to back it up because we got witnesses here that he does not stand behind the word that he promised. Yet the prosecuting attorney speaks on. The prosecuting attorney says, which is Satan. Yet God promises that all things are possible to believers. God says that in His word. The prosecuting attorney is is sealing up his case now. See, he thinks he's got it because the three witnesses to give witness and give it to the scripture and quoted the scripture right and everything the way they've, they've done it. And now the prosecuting attorney is also sealing them little places that God promises. That、uh, all things are possible to them that believe. Yet again, the prosecuting attorney speaks, Satan, and said, "God promises to be alive after He has been crucified. Promises He promises He's alive. Yet, and also He promises in His Scripture, Hebrews thirteen eight, that He is the same." Yesterday, today, and forever, and he's unable to support or back up what he promises. He's nailing it down real tight so that there's not a a chance to get out of it. He's not able to do it. God cannot keep his word. Other word. He claims that he is alive from the dead. He claims also in John fourteen twelve that he that believeth in me. The works that I do shall he do also. He hasn't been able to support that. He said also in the scripture, "Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for because I live, you live also." Notice again, he claims that in Mark, the the seventeenth chapter, speaking of the days of Sodom, which we're now living, like it was in the days of Sodom. That the scene of the world would be in the same position, and that God would come down, being the Word manifested in flesh here on earth, and would be able to do just the same things that, that, that God did, which was a man in human form, which was called by Abraham Elohim. And Jesus said, "When the Son of Man is being revealed in the last days." That he would reveal himself in the same manner that was taken in the days of Lot, given the scene. He also promises that he would be with us, even in us, unto the consummation or the end of the world. And he also claims that both heavens and earth will fail, but his word will never fail. Now I think the prosecuting attorney. Have, thinks he has his case pretty well sealed up. He's got witnesses to prove that this word is not the truth. Now you are both judge and jury. This afternoon, you, your mind is the jury, and your actions is the judge. You, your whatever your jury's verdict is, you'll act out what your verdict is. See, you'll have to do that. Cause your action speaks louder than your words. See, that's right. You can say something, but if you don't mean it, you can't act it. See, your actions will go louder than your words. Notice. Now, let the prosecuting attorney step down. He's give had his witnesses, and they've testified. The prosecuting attorney has placed the word out here and sealed it just the way he wants it. For he thinks he's got the case completely sealed up now, so let the prosecuting attorney and his witnesses step down from the stand. Now we will call the defense witness, the Holy Spirit.、Amen. You know, if there's a defendant, there has to be a defense witness.、Amen. So we'll call the defense witness to defend the defendant, the Holy Spirit. The first thing the Holy Spirit says when he steps up is this. He wants to call the attention of the to the prosecutor, the one that's trying to try the case. It's indicted. 
that the prosecutor has misinterpreted the word to the people just like he did the first human being, Eve, in the Garden of Eden. Amen. He's misinterpreted the word to the people. And the Holy Spirit, the defense witness, calls the attention to this. Notice, he said that the, the prosecutor has said that these promises are to believers, and that it, Believers is the only thing that the promise is to, Amen. not to unbelievers and skeptics. Right. The defense witnesses claims that God distinctly said that it was to believers Amen. and calls the attention that each one that testified in protest against the word admitted that others claimed to be healed. Right. See? So that throws him out right now. See? But let's go on with the case a little while. And the defense witness should know whether they are believers or not because he is the one that quickens the word. Amen. He knows whether they believe or not, don't you think so? He should know. He knows whether they are believers or not because he's the only one who can put life in the word. Amen. Here would be my body standing here without a spirit, I'd be dead. But it's only life can quicken this body to move. And it's only the Holy Spirit that can quicken the Word. Amen. He's the only one who can put it in action. And he ought to know whether they are believers or not. And against their own testimony that they said others claim to be healed. And others claim to see these things, but they didn't. Now I see his witness is already condemned. Now, he quickens the word, and again, he wants to call the attention of the word of the prosecutor, or the prosecutor that's in question. He never set any certain time for this healing. He said, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. God shall raise them up. He said, they shall lay hands upon the sick. And he didn't say they'd jump up right there and be healed. He said, they shall recover if they believe. Amen. Yeah. Misquoting the word. Yeah. I think we've got a good defense witness. Yes. Now, there, he should know whether they believe or not. He could say that. And he, he certainly does correct the scripture here because the defense witness always did that in the Bible terms. The word always corrects itself. And we find that he said that Satan has misquoted the word to that unbeliever, and the unbeliever know no different. But the one that believed it know just exactly what it said and held on to it. Amen. Right. But their claims was they couldn't prove it, but they claimed it themselves, and they was like we claim to be saved. They say, well, show me how you're saved. My life proves I'm saved. The way I act proves whether I'm saved or not. No matter how much I testify about it here, you'll know how I live whether I'm saved or not. Same way it is by healing. If you accept it and believe it, you're going to act like it. Amen. There's going to be such a change in you. There's nothing to take it out of your mind, no more than your salvation. It's God's Word. You've got to accept it on the same basis. Amen. By faith you are saved. Jesus said to the woman who touched his garment, he said, Thy faith has saved thee. Now, I'm not a scholar by a long ways, but I have looked up a few words. Now, that word there comes from the Greek word sozo, which means saved just like... Materially saved or spiritually saved? You're saved sozo. He saved her from a premature grave the same as he saves you from hell. Sozo, the same Greek word is used. Notice, thy faith has sozo, saved thee from the sickness that you had. Notice, same word every time. Again, calling the attention now, the prosecutor has misquoted the word and God never said that they would jump up right quick as soon as they had hands laid on them. But he said, they that believe would recover. Amen. That is, if he believes. It's only two believers. And again, the, the defense witness wants to call the attention to the court this afternoon that God said that his word was a seed. The word is a seed. That a sower so, if this saw seed falls in the right kind of soil, 
that's got enough uh, fertility in it to make this seed spring to life, quicken it, it'll live. Amen. Now, when a man plants a seed, if you're a farmer or know anything about planting any seed, if you plant a seed today, some corn, say you put it in your garden, and tomorrow morning you go out and dig it up and look at it and say, well, there's no difference in it. You plant it back. The next day you go back, look at it and say, there's no difference in it. It will never come up. It can't do it. When you dug it up, you spoil the picture right there. Yes. You've got to commit it to the earth. Amen. And that's up to the earth to do the rest of it. Amen. And every time that you look at your symptoms, testify about them, complain about them, God can never heal you. You commit it to God and believe His word. Whether it's sprouting, whether it's whatever it's doing, you don't care. God promised it. And potentially, you have your healing when you accept it. It's in seed form. If I asked you for an oak tree and you gave me an acre, potentially I have an oak tree. If I asked you for an ear of corn and you gave me a grain of corn, potentially I have an ear of corn. Amen. Then I commit it to the ground and water it. And keep all the weeds away from it that would draw the strength from the ground around it. Keep the weeds out. Then it'll automatically grow because it's committed and it's a germatized seed. Now, if the seed isn't germatized, it won't. But if a seed has a germ of life into it, there's nothing can keep it from growing. Someone said, what do you think about the resurrection? Go out here in the wintertime. Pour a piece of concrete down in your yard. And where's your thickest of grass next year when the spring comes? At the edge of the wall. See, when that sunshine and the world rocks around into position of that sun again, there's no way at all to hide it. Life finds its way. It winds its way under that concrete and so forth and comes right out to the end of the walk and sticks its head up and praises to Almighty God. The sun, S-U-N, controls all bodily life. And the S-O-N controls all eternal life for him and him alone has eternal life. Can't hide it. There's bound to be a resurrection. Don't care where you're at, you're coming anyhow. And you've got to get healed if you believe it and accept it. Amen. It's a seed that a sower sowed and it fell into the ground. And if it comes, some fell on rocks, you know, it didn't have no root. Some fell in thorns and disappointments and that choked it out. But some went where there was no weeds and thorns and rocks. Now, it depends on what you, if you let some unbeliever come to your house or, or some unbelieving person tell you, wow, there's that stuff, that's no, there's no such a thing as that. You're letting weeds come in. Amen. You resent that. Yes. Say, God said so. Amen. That settles it. I'm healed because I believe it in my heart. Amen. That faith laying there and all the unbelief taken away from it is got to bring it out. Amen. That's right. Now, the defense witness wants to call a, a few witnesses to the platform. Would we have time to do it? The defense witness wants to call a witness now. His witnesses, as a prosecuting attorney, called his witness. The defense witness shall call first the prophet Noah. Let him witness. Noah, what do you have to say now this afternoon about it? He said, I was lived in a scientific age. Far beyond the scientifics of this age. It had never rained upon the earth. God watered the earth by the vegetation and so forth by springs which is beneath the earth. But one day God came to me and told me that it was going to rain water out of the skies. I gave my message and he told me to build an ark that I did. And said it was going to rain water out of the skies. And Mr. Unbeliever, Mr. Skeptic and all them fellows sitting there. They scoffed at me and laughed at me for believing for such a miracle as that. When scientifically proved there is no water up there. They could shoot the moon. They could shoot the stars. They could do things of that type. They built things in it we can't build today. So they proved scientifically there wasn't any rain up there. But Noah said, God told me it was going to rain, and I believe if God said so, he's able to put water up there. So I pounded away. Mr. S Mr. Unbelief scoffed at me. Mr. Skeptic doubted me. 
mystery and patience, I pounded away till I built the ark. Every day they come by and said, well, I guess it's going to rain today. Ha oh, ha See, same way. I thought you was well. I thought you was going to get well. Where's the rain at? You know, after all, Prophet Noah, as you're supposed to be one, you said that, now remember, that's not, that, that's people that's pretending they are believers. Yes. You know, Mr. Unbelief and Mr. Skeptic, those are, they play claim they're believers. Well, a Prophet Noah, we always know you was a false prophet. Because you got foolish ideas that don't cope with science. They don't cope with the modern trend. See, you, you don't cope with our pastors. There's something wrong. We know that you're not really a prophet, but you said it was going to rain. That was a month ago. No rain yet. Two years passed. Hey, hey, prophet, I thought you said that God said so. He did say so. Well, two years has passed. Five years, twenty years, fifty years. The ark's completed. Noah's sitting in the door. Here comes Mr. Scoffer, Mr. Unbeliever, Mr. Skeptic, Mr. Impatient. Well, now, where is the rain? God said it was going to rain. He didn't say when. He said it was going to rain. He didn't say when. He just said it's going to rain. Get an ark. You'd be safe in it. It's going to rain. He didn't say when it was going to rain. He said it's going to rain. And I built the ark. Well, it looks to me like if you built the ark and you've done your part, God will do his part. He will. Amen. But he didn't say when he would do it. He just said it's going to do it. It's going to rain. So we find out. He said then years passed to 119 years. And just like in about seven days in being a hundred and twenty years, Mr. Unbelief, Mr. Scoffer, all these others, Mr. Skeptic rather, and Mr. Impatient, they all made fun of me and everything and said I was crazy to believe such a rational promise as that. That if God did promise me that, he told something that wasn't true and he wasn't able to back up what he said. But I believe God and held steady. Amen. There you are. I believe him. I held steady. And you know, one day, they come up to laugh at me and the door was shut. They said, well, the old fanatic went out there and shut the door, I suppose. But I heard them. But I told them, God shut the door. No doubt that the rain will fall today. That'll be it. The first day passed by, there was no rain. Then they really scoffed at me, telling God shut the door. I don't believe such stuff as that. Noah shut the door himself, him and his sons. See? Scoffer, unbeliever, skeptic. All right, it went on for a while. But on May the 17th, one morning, it rained. And it's, it absolutely destroyed all those people that was put to a test against the Word of God and saved those who believed God and made preparations for Him. Noah said, let me test it. Noah, Noah stepped down. Let's call another witness. We haven't got time this afternoon. Let's let the... The defense witness now called the second witness. He'll call Abraham. Abraham said, I was just an ordinary man, a believer. And God spoke to me by his word and said one day that I have a child by Sarah. Sarah was 65 and I was 75. I married her when she was about 16 years old. She's my half-sister. And she was sterile and I was, she was barren and I was sterile. So there was no way for us to have this child. And so we went on for years, but God promised it. And we went out and got all the bird eye and the pins and the, everything got ready for the baby. It made the little booties and Sarah. And the first month passed by, I said, Sarah, and you remember, she's about 20 years of past menopause. And I said, now, Sarah, is there any difference this, like, these last 28 days? No, no difference. Well, I know we're going to have the baby anyhow. And we went on and on year after year, and I still believe God. Mr. Unbeliever, Mr. Skeptic, and Mr. Impatient tried their best to get away. They tried to tell me I was wrong. Why? Abraham, you was a successful farmer. You were a fine man. Everybody thought of you. But you went off on the deep end. You're believing something that can't be true. It's unscientific for an old man like you and an old woman like Sarah to have a baby. But I believe God anyhow. It was 25 years later. He didn't tell me when I was going to have that baby, but he said I would have it and I believed God and counted anything that was contrary as though it was not. 
He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. No matter how many scoffers said, you're not, you can't be, it's impossible. Get next to yourself, you're crazy. He said he grew stronger and stronger all the time. Amen. That's what Amen. genuine faith does. That don't know, no doubt. But if you don't know that, you'll give up right quick. So, well, Abraham, I, I think you would, uh, you would make a very good witness. The word doesn't say when I was going to have the baby the first month, but it said we would have the baby. All right, let's call another witness right quick. Isaiah the prophet. Let's ask him something. Why well, he said the Lord spoke to me one day in prophecy. I was a, a prophet. Everybody knowed that what I said, the Lord honored. And they all believed me as a prophet. And one day there comes something rational. And it said a virgin shall conceive. Well, now that was unusual. And it's usually in that unusual thing that God works. Yeah. See? It's too strange. Like Joseph, he, he wanted to believe Mary, but it was so unusual, you see. Too unusual. So I said, when I made that prophecy, everybody believed me. So every young girl got ready, that was unmarried, got ready to uh, have a virgin-born child. Day after day, year after year, it passed on. And then they began to believe that I was a false prophet. But I know it was the same God that had always made these promises, so I stayed right with it. Amen. And it was some 800 years later before the baby come, but a virgin did conceive. Amen. His words come to pass. Right. Quickly, let's call another witness. Let's call Moses. Moses, you were born, all prophets are predestinated, we know that. Gifts and callings without repentance. Jeremiah, the God said, before you was even conceived in your mother's wombs, I knew you and sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. Jesus Christ was a woman's seed from the Garden of Eden. John the Baptist, 712 years before he was born, Isaiah saw him say, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. See, gifts and callings ain't laying hands on one another, it's what God does. Born from birth. And those gifts are right in you when you're born. Notice, Moses, born to be a prophet, and here he was out in the wilderness after 40 years of getting rid of his education that he had got down from Egypt. And yet, God appeared to him and spoke in a sign and in a voice, a pillar of fire, and a voice that was very scriptural and said this, I'm with you, Moses. You'll be my mouth. And Moses said, I complained. I, I didn't think that my mouth was worthy. I, I stammer a little. I, my, my, my speech is not good. And God said to me, who made the mouth of man? And if you can't believe that, I know Aaron can speak well your brother. You be God and let him be your prophet. Let him perform and you speak the word. And I'll be in your mouth and speak the word. Yes. Now that's a pretty good setup. So away I went. And everybody laughed at me because I was right then 80 years old. I had white beard hanging way down like this. And I had my wife sitting on a mule and a uh, little Gershom on her side. And I was going down to Egypt. My eye set towards heaven and this old crooked stick in my hand. I was going down to take over. A one-man invasion. And the thing of it was, he did it. Right. That's right. Amen. He did it with a crooked stick where he couldn't do it with an army. That's right. But God said so. That settles it. So when I first come before Holy Father Pharaoh, the pastor, you know, and perform the miracle that God told me to do, a sign with my hand or with a stick, you know, Pastor Pharaoh down there, he didn't want to cooperate with me to begin with. But when I had to force my way in to get it, you know, he kind of made, tried to make the work of the Lord look shady. He said he had some magicians there who could do the same thing. And the carnal impersonators raised up to impersonate. That's just exactly what Satan does in every move. Amen. Carnal impersonator. Somebody sees something done and somebody try to impersonate it. Right. When then the carnal impersonators come up and turn those sticks into serpents, just like I did, Pastor Pharaoh said, you see, it's nothing but a magician, a souped up magician. And we got the same thing here in scientific. So forth. We just did exactly. We got hospitals and things. Now, of course, I believe that. That ain't what God said. Now, he said, notice. 
said, well, uh, he tried to make it look shady on my part. But I was positive. I know that voice that spoke to me was a written and spoken word of God for this age. So I just held steady. And he just shuffled them all away from me. He finally brought us to the mountain where he told me, after a long, long time, not that day, but a long time afterwards, we finally come to the mountain where he said for a sign I would return to this mountain. I held steady. Let's just grab another witness right quick before we leave. Let's pull up Joshua here. Joshua said, Moses took one out of every tribe, every denomination, and he sent us over to spy out the land. And when we got there at the river and looked across there and seen those Amalekites, the Amorites, Persianites, and what more, said they were giants. Said they people screamed out for fear. Well, we can't do that. If we ever sponsor a meeting like that, our organization will turn us out. We just can't do it. We, we can't have things like that. It's too shady. See, We just can't. Why, well, it's impossible. And when they come back, yet they had the evidence, brought back grapes from that land. And the trouble is, how can a man, a church, or a denomination that's ever tasted of the evidence that he is alive and then the night on the resurrection of us? Right. Amen. How can you do it, Pentecost? You spoke with tongues and interpret tongues as you claim. And then why could you turn the very promised word down for this age? Take part of it. He said, it's a good land. We have an idea. It was a good land. It's proven to be a good land. But that one bunch of grapes wasn't all of it. All Palestine was full of it. Amen. We believe in speaking in tongues and all these other miracles and things and praying for the sick. And then when the promise comes up here to something else, as it was in the days of Sodom, Malachi 4 said just before the great time when the Gentile world will be burned up, just like Sodom it was burned, and then the righteous will walk out upon the wicked, I'll send to you Elijah, anointed with the Spirit, and he will turn the hearts of the children back to the faith of the Father. Return back, always, each one of the times he comes. That's what it was. And why can you doubt that when he brings Christ the promise, the prophets, the word, and everything in a perfectly identified and then turn back and say, No, don't you go out with that meeting. If you do, I'll give you your papers. It'd be my part they could have their goat skins. My name is written on the Lamb's Book of Life, and every believer. So they come back, and Joshua said, When they all come, I could stay there a long time, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So Joshua said, I steal the people. said, I don't care how great they seem to be, how much opposition, how much fanatically it seems. Remember, God said when we were in Egypt, I have given you this land. I give it to you. Now he just going in there, sweep it out and plaster the walls and tell you, come in and get you a marsh chair and sit down and say, I'll have the maids to fix the bed for you. He don't do it that way. You... Joshua was told by God, everywhere the soles of your feet steps, that I've given you. Footsteps meant possession. And every promise in the book is to believers, but you've got to make footprints to it. Amen. You've got to fight every inch of the way. Amen. You haven't got no fight in you, then get out of the game. Amen. I went in here not long ago, I believe it was in this state. Georgia Tech or somewhere up there is having a, I don't know, I know I might, might have been in the east. I went into a football stadium. I seen a little, a little sign that always kind of inspired me. It had a sign up over the door when I come out from the dressing rooms. And there it had a sign that said, It's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight that's in the dog. <laughs> and that's right here. It ain't how much DDD, PhD, LLD you got. It's how much of Christ that's in you. Explain this, explain right. that, and explain this away. It's how much faith you've got to God to believe that He tells the truth. Amen. Well, that's up to you. Depends on what breed you are. If you're Abraham's seed, you do like Abraham does. Call things that were not as though they were. Now, Joshua said, I still the people. By the time, keep quiet. God said so. God said it. That's true. But you know, it was only two days from there. That's Kadesh Barnea. There's only two days they would have been in the promised land. But Joshua said, 
It was 40 years before we took the land. He didn't say when we'd take the land, but he said he let that old generation die off, them unbelievers, and raised up another generation that believed. He didn't say when they'd take the land, but he said they would take the land and we took it. Amen. I think he's a good witness, don't you think so? Yes, sir. Sure do. We took the land after so many years. Now, it's getting late. I just let me have one more witness. Can we? I got a dozen row down here. We could call a hundred or two. But let me just call one more. If you'll pardon me, may I be that witness? I'd like to take the stand for him. Amen. That is back there. This is here now. I know that would be their testimony, but let me take the witness stand once. Oh, my. I remember down there when I was a little boy. You've read my life story. You know the story. I remember on the river down there. I was a young Baptist preacher and was baptized there. About 10,000 people were standing on the bank. And one afternoon, my first great revival, somewhat around 1,000 converts, and I was baptizing them. Out there in the water, the 17th person I was leading out into the water. I heard a noise, and I looked around. It's hot. It's on June 1933 at the foot of Spring Street of Jeffersonville, Indiana. I was leading them out there, and the banks all up and down were just crowded with people. I walked out, and this little boy, I'd seen him at the altar. I said, son... Have you accepted Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior? He said, I have. His name is Edward Calvin. And I said, Edward, do you know what I'm doing now? He said, I do, Brother Branham. I said, I am baptizing you, showing to this audience out here that you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior. When I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, you take on his name. You rise for a new life. And when you leave here, you're to walk in new life. Do you understand that, Edward? He said, I do. I said, bow your head. I said, Heavenly Father, as this young man has confessed his faith in you, and as I has commissioned us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, commissioning them to believe uh, all things which you have taught, I therefore baptize thee, my beloved brother, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I laid him into the water, I come up and heard something. I looked at the crowd. And I heard a voice saying, look up. I thought, what is that? Billy here, his mother, two or three years before we was married, she was standing there, I seen her face white, she had a camera in her hand. Look up! I heard it second time. I was scared. I looked around, the people standing there just looking, just dumbfounded. I heard it say again, look up! And when I looked, here come that same pillar of fire that led Israel through the wilderness, thousands of eyes looking at it, come right down over where I was standing, and said, as John the Baptist was sent forth to forerun the first coming of Christ, your message shall cover the earth and forerun the second coming of Christ. Amen. That went into the newspaper on the Associated Press. Dr. Lee Vale here this afternoon picked it up, plumbing Canada and around. Local Baptist preacher while baptizing a mystic light appears over him right down there in Dallas, Texas, or Houston, Texas a few years ago when people doubted it and hardly know what to do. A fine Baptist preacher wanted to debate with Brother Bosworth. There was no such as divine healing. And when he lost the debate by 100%, he said, let me see this divine healer come forth and perform. I said, I come down to the balcony. I said, I am not a divine healer, sir. I said, you wouldn't want to be called a divine savior. I said, Mr. Bosworth has asked you this question. Was the redemptive names that Jehovah applied to Jesus, yes or no? And you can't answer them. Just one question, that was all. If he's Jehovah Jireh, he must be. If he isn't, he isn't a savior. And you can't separate the names. He's Jehovah Rapha, the healer. Same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. That man could not move or stand there and stuttered. Many of you was there, I guess, to hear it. So the debate was given to Mr. Bosworth, and he never even got one point. And when it was that with the officials of the city, it's not interested in either side. Just knowing what the scripture said. And then he kept saying, let him come forth. They didn't know I was up there, and I was sitting up there with my wife and Little Becky, she graduates this year from high school. I was saying to her, she's just a year old. I was holding her in my arms. And he said, Brother Bosworth said, I know Brother Bram's in a meeting. If he wants to come dismiss it, all right. But said, I never by begin to look around. And there stood about so many hundreds of people, thousands, about 30,000 people. We've been having 800 all along. And went to music house and this, the people come in by planes, by trains and everywhere. And there's where I knew all the Pentecostal groups come together then. It'll take a persecution to run you people together. You'll never believe it. But when that time comes, see, one thing they believe in common, divine healing. So the oneness, twoness, threeness, fourness, and whatever it was, all come together. There they was. And this man said, there's nobody believes in divine healing but a bunch of holy rollers. 
Raymond Ritchie raised up and said, what would you consider holy rollers? So what would you consider sane people? He said, Baptists. He said, all right. How many in this building now can show by a doctor's certificate that Jesus Christ healed you while Brother Branham shared? 300 stood up. But what about that? So he just got fighting angry. I thought I'd walk down. I heard the Holy Spirit say, go down. I looked and here was this light hanging right above where I was at. I walked down and I said, if the gift is in question, that's different. But I'm not a healer. God's a healer. And I said, if I testify for God, God's obligated to testify for me. Now the Douglas Studios, the big camera sitting there. They said, the minister said, take some glosses of that old man. I'm going to skin him and pull his hide off of him and tack his skin on my study door for a memorial to divine healing. Could you imagine a Christian saying that about another one? See, the, you know him by your fruit. So, and he took six re- uh, glosses. He put his fist up under Brother Bosworth's nose before they started the debate. He said, take it like this. And he took it. Brother Bosworth just stood there. You know what? When he took that to the studio back there to examine it, there wasn't one of them. Every one of them was perfectly blocked out. God would not permit that infidel to put his finger under a godly man's nose like that and have the pictures taken. And while I was standing there, I said, if there's any question about the gift of God for discernment, that's the promise of Scripture. That can be proved. That can be proved. But I said, as for me being a healer, no, sir, I am not a healer, sir. He said, as a man, I respect you. As a minister, I, I don't think much of you. I said, I'll return the compliments. And so just went ahead. Like that. So he said, I'd like to see you perform. I'd like to see you hypnotize somebody. Let me see him a year from the day. Start turning out. I said, if I speak for God, God is duty bound to speak for me. And no more said that. And here come that whirl again. Right down in the audience where it was, there come that pillar of fire down, and that big studio camera now snapped the picture. George J. Lacey, the head of the FBI for fingerprinting document, took it at midnight that night when they put it in, it was the only one that had a picture. You, how many has got on your shelves down in your home, see? Hangs in Washington, D.C. in a hall, hall of religious art, the only supernatural being was ever photographed in all the world's history. What is it? Amen. Watch it! Look at it this week! Look what it's done yesterday, today, and forever the same. Amen. If I had 10,000 tongues, I could not get through speaking for him. Yes, sir. My pastor said to me back there, said, boy, you had a dream. No matter what he had. I remember when I first started out and met you people here in these countries. He told me, he said, the first gift will be that you, the voice behind this will be you put your hands upon the sick and don't say nothing. It'll say what it is. How many remembers that? And I said, then it will come to pass. He said to me that night when he met me at Greens Mill. And he, I asked him about it. And he said, that's the way it was in the early days. Said our Lord that he did it the same way. And this is the hour that this must be fulfilled. I know there's a lot of fanaticism in the world. I'm not responsible for other men's testimonies. I only have to answer for mine. Amen. I'm on the witness stand. In a defense for God and his word that I know it's true. And his word, when I heard him tell me that, I would not have believed it if he hadn't showed me in the Bible that his promise for this day. Yes, right. How many remembers I told you it come to pass? He said that he know the very secret of their heart. Raise up your hands. And did it? Yes. It's 33 years later. It didn't happen right then. It come into it like a seed growing. It's come up like his word. And today, I am a witness that he lives. I am a witness that he heals. Listen. We haven't got much time left just for the prayer line. Remember, I'm going to close the case and just leave it like this. If you can believe any witnesses you want to. But remember, your mind is your jury. In every case, there has to be a jury. And then the way you act hereafter will pronounce your verdict. Now, we're going to do just what the Bible said. Lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. That is the believers. These signs shall follow them that believe. Now, if you believe it, we believe it. Hundreds here could stand around over the nation. Florence Nightingale. Late Florence Nightingale's great granddaughter in London, England. Laying a center picture there. Nothing but a shadow. Cancer eat her up. You see her picture on the next page? Look at Congressman Upshaw. In the wheelchair, 66 years. Stood there in California that night and come in. I was walked to the platform. I stand there and they started the prayer line. I said, I see a, 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 a colored lady here before me. And she's got a little baby. There's a doctor standing. It's, uh, it's operating on that baby and it's paralyzed. And the doctor was thin. He was wearing tortoise shell glasses. And it, it paralyzed the baby. Way down on the outside there, a 
typical old Aunt Jemima, weighing about 250 pounds. Here she come knocking ushers every way, pulling that stretcher that her baby was on. I said, Lordy mercy, that was my baby. And the usher said, you can't come in the line. You're having a prayer card, lady. Well, I said, lady, she said, I was going up there and they couldn't hold her. She's too big for them. So she's pushing right on through the line. Amen. She went on up. And when she got there, almost there, I said, just a minute, lady. If the Lord God could know what she was out there, I said, I said that's the baby, all right. I said, I cannot tell you nothing about it. I said, the only thing I know is just pray for the baby and I'll do that from right here. I said, but the only thing I can say is what I've seen. She said, that was about two years ago, sir. And she said, my baby, when they removed the tonsils, it paralyzed the baby. It says, it's been paralyzed ever since. I said, well, if your faith could touch him to bring that down, why don't you just sit there and pray? I turned around and I said, as I was seeing in my message, I looked and I seen going down through the street. It looked like an alley. A little colored girl, the same one, with a doll on her arm, rocking it as she went along. I said, Auntie, God has heard your prayer. Okay. The baby's healed. Thank you. Up got the baby and I had to quieten it with like a militia and take that baby down through the crowd like that. Just a few minutes, I said, I see an old man. He's on a haystack. Now he's a young boy. He fell and hurt his back. I said, they had to bore holes in the floor to keep his uh, cock from uh, vibration off the floor. A bunch of believers, everybody in one heart and one accord, said they're hundreds and times hundreds. And I said, he becomes a great man, a speaker of some sort. And it left me. I went on, started on. Just then, Dr. Ern Baxter found out way back there in the wheelchair group, way back in the bank. He said, that was Congressman Upshaw. Did you ever hear of him? I said, no, sir. He said, back years ago, he ran for president. I said, I don't know him, sir. I said, uh, he said, uh, uh, said, if I bring him to show, and I said, who is he? He said, sitting right there. And so they wheel him up. His wife did. He said, young man, how'd you ever know me? He said, Dr. Roy E. Davis, the one that ordained you in the Missionary Baptist Church. And, and he was a, a head speaker for the uh, Southern Baptist Convention. He said, he was the one sent me here for you to pray. He said, I've been prayed for since I was a little boy. But I always believed that God would heal me because I took the right stand in the time of prohibition. I, uh, when liquor was going to be brought in, I was called one of the dry bones. He said, I lost the president of the United States because of my stand. I said, that's a gallant thing, sir. I said, may the Lord bless you. I said, all right, bring your first patient. You're the first person who's come up. When it did, something happened to the lady and they told her about it. I turned to look again and I seen that old congressman with a pinstripe suit on, a red necktie, going down, bowing himself like this to the people. He's walking right across the people. I said, congressman, Jesus Christ has honored you. You're 86 years old now. But God has honored you. Look like when he's going to heal you. He heals you when he's a boy and your bones is all brittle and all, uh, uh, you know, flexible and so forth. I said, look like it healed you then, but he's healed you now. He said, do you mean I'm healed now? I said, thus saith the Lord. I said, if you got a, a pinstripe suit, he said, he's wearing a dark suit with a red tie. And I said, you got a pinstripe suit? He said, yes, sir, just bought one the other day. I said, rise up. Jesus Christ makes you whole. And how many knows it? His testimony stood on the uh, Billy Graham's meeting on the White House steps and saying, leaning on the everlasting arm. Never went to crutches or wheelchairs again as long as he lived. Amen. Jack Moore and I was younger in old Mexico that night where had to be let down over the wall. A little woman there, a little Mexican Catholic. The night before that, laid hands on an old blind man. He got his sight. And this little woman, he said, Billy, come to me. He said, Daddy, I call the man manana. Manana means tomorrow. He was so slow. He was giving out the prayer cards. And Billy went with him to see he didn't sell one. So he said, he gave out all the prayer cards. And this little woman's got a baby that died this morning. It's nearly 10 o'clock at night. Outside in that bull ring there. And the, and the rain is the pouring down. Some kind of a big open field light. And he said, they brought me in and let me down some ladder steps. Brother Jack Moore and him is here now. He is on the platform. He said, I've got 300 ushers standing there. Can't hold that woman. So she climb up over their shoulders, run between their legs. And I told her she couldn't get up here because she didn't have a prayer card. And we ain't got no more prayer cards. She didn't care about that. She won't have hands laid on that baby. She's seen a Catholic man have been blind for 20 or 30 years receive his sight by being prayed for. She, and a rack of old garments. You think this is something. Oh, three times this platform stacked that high. Which is as far as you can see it. Old shawls and hats. How they ever know who it belonged to, I don't know. But they believe. Amen. Simple, child faith. Hallelujah. So I said, well, I said to Brother Jack, he and I have part of hair the same, you know. So I, I said, Brother Jack, she wouldn't know the difference between you and I. You go down there and pray for the baby. And he said, all right, Brother Bram, you started down. And Jack's sitting right there. So we was, uh, we started, I started to preach like this. And I looked. And I seen a little Mexican baby, a little black-faced baby standing here in front of me, just smiling, his little gums, didn't have any teeth. 
I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Bring the baby here. I said, Lord God, I don't know if she'd run up and have a crucifix in her hand. I said, Padre, means father. I said, stand up now. She had a little blue looking blanket and a little baby stiff dead laying on it, just soaking wet, her hair all down. Pretty little lady, probably her first baby in her 20s, you know. She is holding down like this. And I said, I said, I'll pray for the baby. I laid my hands. I don't interpret the prayer. I said, Lord God, I only seen the vision. I don't know. And about that time, it let out a kick and began screaming and crying like that. I said, Brother Espinosa, to the the chairman of the meeting, I said, don't you just take that woman's testimony. You send a witness to that, to the doctor. The doctor signed a witness which appears in a man's voice of healing. The baby died with double pneumonia that morning at nine o'clock in his office, pronounced dead. No respiration has been laying in the rain all day dead. And was healed and is alive today as far as I know, living to the kingdom of God. I have many things out of Africa where I've seen 30,000 raw heathens give their life to Jesus Christ. God, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. As his witness, you are, your mind is a jury, and your action is your judge. Now, bow your heads just a moment. Lord Jesus, the trial hasn't started. How many more could we call up here on the platform? You said that if they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. You said, the works that I do shall you all. So the woman touched your garment. You turned and told her what had happened. And you keep all your words. There's none of them wrong. The wrong is in the unbeliever, Lord. Mr. Unbeliever, he's the one that contaminates the person. Mr. Skeptic and that impatient one that can't wait upon the Lord and yet caught in himself the seed of Abraham. Oh, Holy Spirit, the defense witness, you know who has faith and who don't. God, I pray that you'll move back every unbelief this afternoon. And may the great judge of all the earth come forward now. The one who wrote the word. He is the word. May he come forward. And as these people pass through here to be healed this afternoon, may each one of them make up their mind now. Their own trial. I'm laying it right in their laps, Lord. Their mind is their jury. And the way they act from here on when they pass through this line, I'll prove what they think about the Word of God. So grant, Lord, that this last message that you preached to your disciples when you commissioned them, the last words that fell from your sacred lips, if they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. That is, believers. Last things you said. The first commission you ever commissioned man to do. Matthew 10 was heal the sick. Cast out devils. Freely as you receive, freely give. The last commission, go into all the world, cast out devils, lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Lord, may the people realize that that faith anchors like it did to all these witnesses. They believe it. No matter what, don't have to happen now, but what you said, you bring it to pass. You said if you don't doubt in your heart, by and by it shall come to pass. The seed has to grow. May the people see it and understand for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Are you a believer? Amen. Now, he keeps all of his words. You believe that? Yes. Now, real reverend, everybody, just a moment before we call the prayer line. We want order. Now, remember, have you made up your mind? Have you come to a verdict, jury? Raise your hands if you've come to a verdict. Is God justified or not justified? Is his word, is he the same yesterday and forever? Or is he not? Now, if you raise your hand, pass through this line, then the way you act from here out, do you act like Abraham or Mr. Unbeliever? Hmm? Mr. Skeptic, Mr. Impatient. Discard them. Believe Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm a stranger to you. But now to let you know that he still is here, and if you just accept his word in your heart, now, you might not be able to do this. We have one of them in one generation. There was one Moses. Ever the rest of them didn't have to turn a, a dust into fleas and so forth and water into blood. There was one Moses. The rest of them just believe what he said. There was a group up there wanting to make an organization out of it. Dathan and them. And God said, separate yourself from them in the world to a fan. And that was only a, that was a type of this being the antitype. So the world gets them by and by. You see what happens to every one of them. But thou canst 
believe all things are possible. Do you believe that? Yeah. Sure, all things are possible if they believe. All right, you pray. You put your faith in Almighty God. There was a question here that I wanted to say here. Yes. When your neighbors see you and the people that sees you come through this line this afternoon, when they see you coming through this line, they will know what your verdict is after you hear the way you act and the way you testify. If the next time you run your pastor, oh, I didn't get it, I want to try it again. See, you're digging up the seed. It will never come to pass. See, don't dig up your seed. Commit it and leave it there. Forget about it. That's up to God. In your heart, if you can believe it, it'll happen. Do you believe that, sir, sitting right there, that gray-looking suit on sitting right back there looking at me? Do you believe that? Then your nervousness left you. I've never seen the man in my life. Well, we strangers one another, sir. That's right. That's what you're suffering with. That you might know, me being a servant of God, the woman sitting next to you is suffering with stomach trouble. That's right. You believe it? Raise up your hands you believe you're healed. Just have faith. The woman sitting next to her has got heart trouble. You believe that? God will heal you? All right, sir. If you believe it, you can have it. One sitting next to her has female trouble. You believe it? God will heal you? The woman sitting next to that, the heavy set lady, she's got diabetes. You believe God will heal you? The woman sitting up there has got something wrong with her. She's got, she's got female trouble sitting right up there on the end of the road. I believe that's her daughter sitting right back from her there. Has got some kind of a head trouble. Was caused by an accident. Is that right? Raise up your hands in the balcony. What is he? I'm his witness that he's alive. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He keeps all his words of works that I do should you. What did them people up in the balcony? Somebody else believe for a minute. Now you'll be watching some unbelievers. My parish. How many of you see the gun? Yeah. No one does yet, but the weak we go together. All the people in this room here that's got a bad heart. Wait for the whole field in a minute. How many believe in pastors are here today? It's on, on trial also. And you believe that Mark 16 is true greater than it. All believe in pastors. Come here. If I leave here and you see what's going to take place this afternoon, and these people being healed. Then some of them say, see, uh, usually the pastor says, a little different ministry of going, he leaves the pastor flat before the congregation. The congregation say, oh, if Brother Roberts comes back, Brother Osborne, Brother so-and-so, Brother Brandon, somebody, oh, he, your pastor has the same right to this than I do. Anybody else? The, your pastor is a man sent from God, the same as any other evangelist. And I want the real God-fearing, believing pastors to come here and stand with me. Walk up here. Form yourself a double line. I'm the man that's free and believing. Don't let other believers go give them the sick. If you, if you judge this scripture right, and today while God has appeared to us here and showed that he is on trial, and we have believed him and know that he tells the truth and is right. You believe it? You believe that nervous is left you, sir? Sitting out here again? You believe it to make you well? Have your stomach trouble next to it? You believe that God will have a stomach trouble to make you well? You believe that you can have it also. Is this all the believing pastors there is in here today? All right, that's enough. One more time. Let all the people that got prayer cards. And believe Mark 16. Now remember, won't you tell me if you don't believe it? See, don't come up here and have hypothesis. See, that's worse than ever. If you don't believe it, just say, no, I don't believe it. Go on with Mr. Unbeliever, Mr. Skeptic, or somebody. But if you're a genuine seed of Abraham and you want to take your stand, your verdict has been, has been made, and you want to show the world that your verdict is made, that you believe that every word Jesus Christ said is the same, and the witnesses proved it to you, say, as he is the same, that's true. Let those who got prayer cards here walk right down here and stop right here. I just stand right there if you will. I just fall on out. Let all that's in this section here that's got prayer cards turn and go around the back and fall in line right behind them on this side. Now, let all that's in this other section over here turn and go back to the wall 
that way you can follow right in behind this line here. Let all this is about to be follow right behind this. All you just got there for is to be prayed for. And you've made up your mind, you're perfectly settled, you've done been reached, go towards the wall and form a line coming right in behind here. Now, what does the Bible say? Let me read it again. A strange thing, it's still open to the place. I believe the Lord wants us to read that again. See? Afterwards, he appeared unto the eleven. He did us the same way this afternoon. He's here. Yes. How many believe that Christ and the Holy Ghost, if the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Ghost? Of course it is. There's no three or four gods. There's only one God. There's three attributes of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but they're not three gods. That's heathen. See, there's only one God, and that's attributes. God the Father was in the wilderness as a pillar of fire. All right. God the Son, God the Father created the body, which was God the Son, and lived in the Son. See, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. you believe that? If you're a Christian, you believe it. And then a little while in the world seeth thee no more. And now look, Jesus said, I came from God and I returned to God. At his death, burial, and resurrection, he ascended up. And when Saul of Tarsus was on his road down to Damascus, a big light fell in the fire and stuck before him. Is that right? Amen. What did he do? He struck him blind. And when he raised up, he said, Now remember, he's a Hebrew. He knew what that was, or he would have said, Lord. Lord, who are you? He knew that his people followed that light, that pillar of fire, brought him out of Egypt. Lord, who are you that I persecute? He said, I'm Jesus. Yeah. Hard for you to kick against the priest. It was him that come in as a pillar of fire that night and turned Peter out of jail. And now look, if that same spirit returns, won't it have the same attributes that it had here? If it's alive. Well, what is this pillar of fire? That, now, if I never see you man again and you people, my testimony's proven true. The Bible testifies of it. Scientific world testifies of it. That... George J. Lacey said, I often said it was psychology myself, Mr. Branham, but said, I've had it under ultra ray and every kind of little uh, infant ray and everything that I could find. The light struck the lens and this lens won't take psychology. Amen. So if I live or not, it's true anyhow. The church knows it's true. Amen. Science knows it's true. Now what about you? Remember, it's not me. It's him. Amen. It's not me. I'm nobody, but just one of you all. It's him. He has to get somebody. Nobody's worthy of it. But somebody has to do it. Remember, it's not an easy job, but it's a glorious job. To know that your Lord is here and you can tell your brethren the truth. But it's hard when they won't believe it. But that, we all have to confront that. Remember now. Now, you audience, are you all about lined up now? It looks like they are. Now, if there's some in the balcony, follow right in behind this line here. Now, remember, these are your pastors. Man of God who believe God. Are you believers? You stood here to make a testimony that you believe this Mark 16 is true. All right. Now the Bible said, The prayer of faith shall save the sick. God shall raise them up. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Now we're going to pray for you now while you're standing reverently, quietly. And then when you pass through here, just like you was coming, you'd confess that you believe Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. And then you go to the pool to be baptized, or the creek, river, or wherever it's at. And when you're baptized, that's all the preacher can do. Preach the word. You believe it. You're baptized for the remission of your sins. Rise up a new life. Then the way you act from there on proves whether you really accepted Christ or not. Now, if you believe in divine healing and have accepted him now as your healer, we're standing here to lay hands on the sick. The way you act from the end of that line on the rest of your life will be the judge no matter what you say. See what I mean? And you're just as sure to get well as you are to remain a Christian. How long are you a Christian after that? As long as you believe. And you're healed as long as you believe. Notice. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink a deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. In the face of this, 
My mind reached the verdict about 35 years ago. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. By believing him, he's identified himself here this afternoon in fallible proof, a miracle. Anything that's unexplainable is a miracle. The show he does every time. You say, why don't you just... Did you know one woman touched his garment and he said, I got weak? How many knows that? Virtue is gone from him. Now, he was the son of God. How about me, a sinner saved by grace? But he promised he would do it. It's his promise. He don't have to do it, but he promised he'd do it. Now, do you believe it all in the line? Believe your mind has reached that verdict. That's going to be in your lap now. Your mind has reached that verdict that you believe that Jesus Christ spoke these words. If you do, you in a prayer line, raise your hand. All in the prayer line accepts your healing upon the basis of this, that you believe your pastors and all of us, that we are serving the true living God, and that witness that you see of him this afternoon identifies him. Here with us, the one that made the word the same yesterday and forever. If you do, raise up your hands. Praise Lord. It's got to happen. Amen. It's just Amen. got to happen. I don't care who you are. Amen. If you'll stay with that, it's got to happen. Amen. Moses brought him out of Egypt as same as the virgins who have brought forth the child without an uh, earthly father. It'll be the same thing. You don't doubt it. Roy, come here now and take this. Same Amen. only believe. Just a minute till we pray. Ministers, let's bow our heads. Congregation everywhere. Our Heavenly Father, Amen. The, the strain of this moment. We are wondering, Lord. Just how many really believes the seed has been sown, the word has been read, Christ, the Holy Ghost, has appeared before us and showed that that light that was in this light, and he was the light of the world, he's the light now, he's the great eternal light, and he has appeared before us this afternoon and done just what he said he would do in this generation. The word's been thoroughly spoken. The word's been thoroughly identified. And the people now, if they just thoroughly believe it with all their heart, we're praying for them, Father. Yes. Take all unbelief. May the man that would witness against you this afternoon, old man unbelief, skeptic and impatience, may he be cast from among us today. May he go into outer darkness. May he leave this building Amen. that the great defense witness, the Holy Ghost, can quicken every word as they pass by. Granted, may they go from here. Their, their mind has already passed the verdict and they're coming through. And now, Holy Spirit, quicken that word to them that the work is finished as soon as the last application has been done by laying hands on the sick. Grant it, Lord. I claim every one of their healing yes. in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Next thing to be done, laying on our hands is like a ceremony for baptism, and you're buried within man, and you rise and walk away to a new life. Amen. You might not feel like it, but you believe it. Just keep staying with it. Finally, after all, you find out you've got a new life. That's the same way it is here. It's a seed that's sown. We're planting it now, we're laying hands upon it. What are we doing? This is identifying ourselves. Like in the Old Testament, to lay hands upon their sacrifice to identify themselves. By faith, we lay our hands upon Christ to identify ourselves with Him. Today, we lay our hands upon the sick to identify ourselves with this Word. You believe now, and the Lord will make you well. Now, Brother Borders is going to be singing quietly in the organs, the pianos, and so forth. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. And just imagine now Jesus coming down from that mountain. There the disciples have failed on an epileptic case after he gave them power to cast out devils just a few days before that. It wasn't that they didn't have power, but he said your unbelief was the reason. Yes. But when he comes to Jesus, he knows he had faith there. I believe with all your heart. Now while we quietly sing, only believe, Brother Moore. Let's all sing it together now. Sing it like this, all that does. Now I believe. Do you? Let's raise your hands. Now I believe. Oh God, in Jesus' name. Heal these, Lord, that these handkerchiefs represent.
for your glory? Grant it, Lord. I You know what we have done? We have followed the commandments of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, are you still with your verdict? I am healed. It's impossible for me not to get well because God made the promise. With my dying lips, the last thing on my lips, I believe I am healed. Do you believe it like that? I believe it. God bless you, my brother and sister. Now let us stand up to our feet just a moment. I don't know when it will be. I hope right away. But yeah, we meet till we meet till we meet at Jesus. He's in our presence now. Till we meet, till we meet, God be with you, till we meet again. Let's bow our heads while we hum it. We have seen and heard and read, and may it guide us to your feet. May we ever remain there, believing your word. Everything that you promised, bring it for Till we Lovely brother, Brother Johnson, takes the dismissive prayer.